Hello, I'm Yoshie Ito and welcome to the latest installment of Asia Society's Asian in America series. Today I'm very excited. I have the pleasure to present Jenny Dorsey, a professional chef, food writer and social entrepreneur who uses culinary arts to express the, a full range of human emotions and social commentary to incite introspection and in a unique and creative way. Jenny um, has left a career in finance and created Artsy Foods for Thought, which is something that is very exciting and, uh, and we will talk about this soon. Jenny has uh, won televised culinary battles, hosted dinners with social impact themes and uh, using modern tools such as virtual reality, augmented reality, poetry, dance, and uh, pottery, and presented it all on a plate of diversity and inclusion. Jenny founded her own nonprofit to use the culinary arts to ignite social change on topics like um, income disparity, um, toxic masculinity, and cultural appropriation, to mention a few. Um, Jenny, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> so how about we start by asking you, how has the pandemic affected your endeavors? Tell us where you're, you are and, and what you're doing right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, the pandemic has definitely made things a little challenging. When the Studio at Tao first started, we really were primarily a video, um, an event-based business. And so when, you know, things shut down, we obviously can't really host events anymore. Um, it's been really hard to try and continue and in, engage our community when most of the time that sort of outreach was in person. So not only were we doing dinners like Asian in America, which we can talk about in a little bit, um, or doing discussion salons, we were also, you know, like making sure we were like meeting people or just trying to get coffee, like, you know, seeing what our patrons wanted. And now we've had to shift and do a lot more programming virtually and try to find ways to curate not only a safe space and a welcoming space, but a space where people genuinely feel like they can connect and be vulnerable one around one another. And often, you know, like over Zoom, you're just meeting someone, how do you get that sort of vulnerability um, has been challenging, but it's been an interesting ride for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So how does food and art work together to increase their impact though? Tell us a little bit. Tell us about your most memorable dinner and, and why was it the most memorable and why did you choose the theme of that dinner and what was the, the reaction of your guests? Yeah, for sure. I think it would definitely probably be one of um, our Asian America series. So in short, Asian in America, which is um, could still be the same name as this program, um, it's an exhibition and dinner series that talks about the Asian American identity through six courses of food, three courses of cocktails, poetry, and virtual reality. And so throughout the course of dinner, people are in and out of virtual reality headsets. Um, so I have one for me, so I can demo virtual reality headsets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, they're listening to audio narration from myself um, and watching a brushstroke by brushstroke uh, representation of the food that they are about to eat, learning about the history, the context, um, and the symbolism behind that, whether that's like techniques of the cooking, whether that's plating, like all together. The videos are pretty short. They're about two and a half minutes each. Um, and yet it totally changes the atmosphere of um, the experience. It changes how people engage with one another, especially when you are in a communal setting. Often you'll find that the extrovert and the introvert energy, you know, they might both start kind of high at the beginning of dinner, but introverts will kind of fizzle out because I'm an introvert myself and I am definitely well aware, like, so it's just like a lot. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of stimulus, and there's usually like one person that starts like dominating the conversation. And over the course of three hours of eating without those new strangers at the table, you feel like sometimes your voice gets clipped a little bit. Like you want to share, but that one, you know, that one person, those two people, they're just like kind of in your space. And so for VR, it gives people like a little escape. Um, as uh, Susan Cain calls it, it's like a re mini restorative niche 
that introverts can have over the course of this time. And we found that it totally changes the engagement. People jump back in after we are renewed and energized. And I think the first time, to answer your question, um, the most memorable experience was when we first debuted Asian in America at um, the Museum of Food and Drink in New York City. And we realized like, wow, like people are engaging in ways that we haven't seen before. Cause we've been hosting dinners for like four years before that, you know, um, we've done every single time it's a dinner and so many different types of spaces, but like, wow, I've never seen people talk like this. I've never seen people interact like this. I've never seen people think through what they're really eating like this. So that was really, really rewarding. That's so interesting. So, but, so tell us in which way, eating food and hearing poetry, like why, why is it different to do it together as opposed to doing it separately? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think it's, it's about making sure that when you are presenting a plate of food in, um, for someone that they are really getting the context that you want them to receive because, you know, you can put a plate in front of a hundred people on there will be a hundred interpretations of it. And that's fine. That's good. You want everyone to have their own experience with the food. But many times um, for chefs, you do have a story that you want to tell. There's a reason that you put the food in the way it did. There's a lot of, um, at least for me, like there's a lot of just symbolism that it's hard to explain. And sometimes I don't do a great job explaining it coherently when I've done dinners before where there was like, you know, no VR, no poetry, nothing. It was just like food. It's like, I'm trying to explain it, but I'm thinking about what's cooking in the kitchen or something's burning in the kitchen, or I'm worrying about that one guest who's late or whatever. And I, my mind isn't there. So people aren't getting a cohesive experience and they're also not getting the total emotion of that particular dish. So I think adding another art form like poetry, like VR, which is like spoken word plus design or plus visual art, um, it just helps people really focus in on the energy that you're trying to put forth for the food. I know that sounds a little like hippy dippy, but um, people do kind of, they channel what you want them to feel and they will bring that energy throughout the course of the meal. I think that really you, you literally and physically see it. Yes. It's like eating mindfully. I mean, we're always reminded that we have to be mindful and everything that we do and so if you're really sitting down and enjoying the dish like feeling it in your tongue at the same time that you are visualizing this new idea you're completely immersed in a different reality so i i am sure it's so exciting and the few people who have had the opportunity to join one of your dinners most count themselves among the really, really, really lucky yeah. selected Thank club. <laughs> well, I want to go back to the idea of Asian American identity. Um, one of your courses I hear in the series is um, modeled about the minority myth. And can you tell us um, how your dish depicts the myth of what you think the effect of such myth is in the Asian American identity. Yeah, of course. So the model minority myth is the last, um, the last savory course of Asian in America. And it talks about, you know, if you're not, not familiar with the model minority myth, I think there's many layers to it. But um, one of the big themes I think is that you're always trying to get away from like, you recognize that you're put on this pedestal, but at the same time, you're put on the pedestal because you're different. Like you can't ever get away from being a minority, even if you're the good minority. And mm -hmm. so I want to ex explain how like the model minority, being a model minority feels. And so there's various components of that um, represented on the dish. So the main protein of the dish is veal sweetbreads. Um, if you're not familiar with veal sweetbreads, they are the thymus gland of baby meals. So they're like right here. Um, and very often, veal sweetbreads are the only organ meat that you'll consistently see on fine dining menus, um, like basically ever. You know, organ meat is generally seen as kind of distasteful or very gross. Uh, however, sweetbreads have this special status, probably because they were kind of used in French cuisine, like in a special way. I don't know, like they just happen to get this acclaim and you'll see them on these fancy menus and they're the only organ meat and they're always prepared in the same way. They're always deep fried and they're always served with kind of this heavy sauce. And that just really like struck me as very much like the model minority myth where yes, you can, you know, break out of the mold of all these other bad minorities, but you're always 
you always have to stay within your lane, you know, just like how Asians are supposed to be quiet, or especially with Asian women, you have to be thoughtful, Asians don't vote, Asians aren't political, you need to stay in your lane, or else you risk being ejected from this model status. Um, on that dish, you also see, if you look down on it visually, there's um, a green maze that's been piped with chrysanthemum puree. And mm -hmm. chrysanthemum is a green that's been um, used in a lot of East Asian cuisines for a long time. It's, you know, that's, I don't know, pretty, pretty normal to see it on menus. And a few years ago, it kind of had this resurgence um, in American, like, chefs are like, I use chrysanthemum. They were making Caesar salads with it. It was terrible. And uh, it's like they were kind of like rediscovering it or they were discovering it for the first time. Um, and so it, it was this very awkward scenario where this is something that we've been eating, we've been consuming for a long time, and yet who gets to lay claim to it? And so that's kind of this maze of like, who gets to lay, lay claim to my identity? Who gets to say, what is a minority? Who is a minority? What is Asian? Because Asia is obviously a big place and who counts as Asian versus non-Asian and how do we delineate between those different areas? Um, also on the dish is seltus, which if you're not familiar with seltus, it's a great vegetable. It's kind of like a watery celery um, that's crispy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to describe it, but anyway, seltus is this vegetable that again, very frequently used in a lot of East Asian cuisines. Um, and Dan Barber from Stonehill Blue Barns, um, uh, Blue, sorry, Blue Hill at Stone Barns, claimed that he like discovered it in some article from like Epicurious in like 2017. And I like to think that if that happened today, people would be like outraged by it. But at the time, literally nothing happened. Nothing, nobody said anything, none of the Asians said anything. And it was like this perfect encapsulation of what the model minority myth does to you is that you just become quiet. You just become, you put your head down, you like, literally shut up um <laughs> and so it's on there's self tooth on that dish there's veal sweetbreads and so you navigate this green maze you make it to the center you know you're putting out your perfect self your perfect self that the dominant class wants to see you as and yet on top of that there's a um a rice gel sheet that i've made so it's kind of like the same texture as when you get those like um like chow fung at like dim sum so kind of slippery a little bit slimy and that's like a very revered very well loved texture in many parts of Asia but generally speaking not very much enjoyed in the U.S. and so the idea is that like on top of being trying to be what everyone wants you to be you mm -hmm. still just can't really hide who you are and therefore you still receive the the, out, the outrage the backlash that these people have of you. So if you look at COVID-19, that's so apparent that it doesn't matter what model minority idea white people might have had of Asians. At the end of the day, you're never American. Um, you can never hide the fact that you look different. Um, so on top of all of this is a sweet and sour sauce. It's made in the Shanghai style. So my mom's side of the family is from Shanghai and I was born there. And there's a lot of misconceptions about what is sweet and sour sauce in the U.S. Um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what is Chinese food, but that's a different story. Um, so this particular sweet and sour sauce was meant to show, like, look, there's so much individualism, but because it's this brown sauce, like, everyone just thinks they know what it will taste like. They think it know, they know what it is, and they think they know who you are, but they don't. Um, so all of that together. And so that's what's being explained in the VR before people eat the course. That's so interesting, and, and and another narrative that uh, you introduce in your dinners is as, uh, also the immigrant narrative, which leads to the scarcity mindset. Uh, you said that the scar scarcity mindset has been believed that uh, there will never be enough food, enough money, enough to eat, and that's one of those uh, aspects that kind of stay stick around with the immigrant narrative right so what circumstances normally culminate to the feeling of scarcity and then what emotions does the scarcity mindset cause and how do you represent that in food yeah i think um it's really important to talk about scarcity especially now because as asian americans are trying to figure out how to how we best stand in solidarity not with 
each other, not only with each other, but also, you know, with other minority groups, a lot of the inability to do so or um, the unwillingness to do so comes from this feeling of scarcity. And if you look, if you do a brief search online of like scarcity mindset or how to combat the scarcity mindset, a lot of times people talk about scarcity or let me rephrase, white um, like psychology, usually uh, websites talk about scarcity as if it's like a personal problem. Like you just need like some mental stamina to get past the scarcity mindset and think about an abundance mindset, which mm -hmm. sounds really nice. But the reality is not only has scarcity like existed because of, you know, actual things that have, have happened to probably everyone, but definitely with immigrants of like losing a lot of material possession, having to start over, like sacrifices, like there's a lot of that. That's I think a consistent thread through a lot of immigrant communities, not just Asian Americans, but specifically for Asian Americans, the scarcity mindset has been used by the government to weaponize and to uh, create strife between Asian Americans and other minority groups. Like the reason that Asian Americans have so much anti-blackness in them is because of the model minority myth, as well as there's a bigger concept called racial triangulation. We don't need to get into like, or we can get into if you want. Um, but there's, that has been consistently upheld by not only government policies, but also media representation that was fueled by the government. So if you look at when Chinese Americans actually were able to immigrate into the US, they were excluded from the U.S. for a long time because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, but then they were suddenly like allowed to come back in because we were wanted China as a strategic ally. And so we decided like, hey, we'll let them in like 20 at a time, but only the skilled ones. So then you have this weird scarcity between like, there's only a few people that can come. There's only the, only, only the really like smart, you know, studious ones can come. And then once they get here, then weaponize that against like, well, we only have so many resources for you minority people. So you guys better, you know, do a good job. And oh, look, Asians have done a good job, especially Japanese Americans after internment, you guys did a good job. So instead of saying, hey, we need more structures to support all minorities, because they can be incredible resource for this country. It's look, Japanese Americans did well. Why didn't Black Americans do well? They are lazy. Like it's always, it's constantly been used to just like build uh, immigrants and minorities against each other um, and keep those in power in power. <laughs> Definitely. You're raising so many, so many interesting points about um, this whole narrative of inclusion and, and immigration. And one other topic that you also focus in your nonprofit is um, the the role of tokenization in the food mm -hmm. media, right? Mm -hmm. Could you explain to your to our audience what is tokenization and why is it detrimental to your work in the culinary arts and uh, to the movement overall? Yeah, for sure. So tokenization, I don't have the definition in front of me, so I'm going to paraphrase. But essentially, tokenization is the act of, you know, making only a, like a symbolic effort um, and usually by using a, a, some people of one specific identity to show that your company, your organization, your, your, your media representation is inclusive when really it is not. So most often you'll hear a token used in like, oh, that one token hire. So um, many, many times you'll see in organizations, big companies days, these days, their entire C-suite is white men, and then they have that one token woman, or that one token black person, or that one token Asian person. Um, and this is something that I'm not totally sure who like coined the term tokenization, but you start seeing it being used um, as far back as the civil rights movement. So Dr. Martin Luther King, um, as well as Malcolm X, both used it in like several interviews or have used like written the word. And you see it consistently throughout like academic journals since then. So the problem with tokenization is that it's, I mean, there's a lot of problems, but one of the big things is not only does it take one person and say, hey, like we have this one Asian person and now we're equal, which is definitely not the case because look at the rest of the board or look at the rest of the company, that person doesn't have real power. It doesn't have real influence. They're there, they're there as a racialized prop for you to you know, benefit from, you being the company, you being the organization. But also when it comes to media representation, when you have that one Asian or that one Asian movie like Crazy Rich Asians, 
uh, it tells everyone else like this is Asia. This is what Asian American representation is. And Asian, crazy rich Asians is not representative of Asian, right? It's representative of one specific subtype of rich Asians, perhaps, but not all Asian. But when there's so little representation and there's only token representation, then it creates the rest of that identity as a monolith. Like all Asian Americans are the same versus people see lots of nuance within white Americans. Like, oh gosh, like there's white Americans that are poor. There's white Americans that grew up here. There's, you know, but that sort of nuance isn't extended to minority groups. So there's a lot of different problems. And on top of that, the token bears the brunt of so much of this. Not only are they supposed to be representing, you know, everyone who is Asian, which is impossible, but they're also feeling like this is the only time I can do that. So I have to do this amazing job. I have to show everything. Like it's, an, it's a completely unfair scenario that they're just kind of set up to lose. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, how can we define Asian American identity then, you know? What factors do you think play into defining such identity? And how do Asian Americans react? Uh, and other minorities, how do they respond and react to the narrative being told about Asian Americans? And, and how, how do you raise this aspect through food? How, how do you do that, you know? It's, it's the yeah. most interesting thing to me because... Um, it's not easy to do what you do and you must spend a lot of time just getting your creative juices going and, and going really into zone of flow so that you can get those kind of creative elements so you can present them to your you know, guests. So t please tell us about the, the way you yeah. do it. And yeah, um, I mean, I think it's really hard to figure out like who identifies as who because at the end of the day everyone's identity is uniquely their own and so you have to ask them like how do you identify you know because maybe someone looks Asian American but that's not like how they identify and that's a big problem if you're in the U.S. is that like we assume a lot on how someone looks we just prescribe them an identity that perhaps is not fair to them um, or is not something that they want to be you know part of and within Asian Americans like there's a lot of complex history between Asia, between the different Asian countries and I think many times gets lost with such a big broad scope of Asian American like the, uh, there's a lot of wars that have happened there's a lot of colonization that has happened there's a lot of unhappiness there's a lot I mean, there's genocides that happens like there's all this like complicated, convoluted stuff. There's also a lot of like ethnicities going on within Asian America, you know. So uh, I think a lot of that needs to be addressed within the um, within the community before we can really move forward. Colorism is a really big problem in the community that we don't really talk about, um, as well as like it's the effects of imperialism on places like Vietnam. You know, there's there's just there's a lot that I think gets lost uh, in translation so to speak. So that's something that the Asian American community, I think, could do a better job working on. And one of the things that I try to do with Asian America is at least try to prompt some of those conversations. And of course, you know, I'm Chinese American, I'm a first gen, I cannot represent everyone from Asian America. Like, I can't represent, I'm Asian American. That is, that's like the problem with tokenization. Like, I have this one Asian American dinner, that doesn't mean that this is like all Asian Americans have to say. Um, so we try to make sure that when we give people uh, prompts before dinner, so everybody actually receives all these email prompts with questions, topics, ideas for them to talk to others at their table, that we are asking those questions like, you know, have you considered what is Asian American? And like, how do you define Asian American? Because that's a conversation in and of itself. Or like, when did you decide that you identify as Asian American? You know, um, I think it's just, there's no wrong answer and there's no one right answer either. It's how do we even make sure that people are having these conversations because it is uncomfortable. And I think it's a touchy topic that people like to generally like to avoid at dinner. So how do we build also a brand where people are coming to us knowing that they want to be made a little bit uncomfortable at, at, a, at a nice seated meal event? Right, right. 
it's very important to um, to make sure that we understand that there's all kinds of Asian Americans and they come in all sizes, shapes, flavors, ethnicities, languages, and everybody comes with their own culture and their own food. So it's very interesting to to touch on those topics. I have one last question, Jenny, before we move to the audience Q&A, but um, a recent article in the New York, in the New Republic noted that food, the food world has been under fire for creating the rise of toxic celebrity chefs and, and how they treat their employees unjustly and wrongly. Um, by looking just at celebrity chefs, uh, you know, what do you think is the biggest weakness or flaw that public, the public is ignoring in, in, in the food industry? Just, just looking at chef celebrities and, and what, what do you have to say as a famous chef? What do you have to say about this? Well, I wouldn't consider myself a famous chef, but um, I think one of the big issues is that there's just a lot of power discrepancy in restaurants and in food in general. Um, what people, I think, don't like to recognize or maybe just don't quite understand is that, in, specifically in the U.S., I won't speak to other countries, there has never been a time where restaurants were suddenly or hospitality was really run in an equitable way. Um, when we first all started, it was like, well, we have slaves and that they were our workforce. And then it was like indentured servants. And then it was like minimum weight, you know, so it's always been a system that was predicated on exploitation of the most vulnerable and those who didn't have power. And that is still the case today. If you look at the restaurant industry, by and large, it is propped up by undocumented Central American workers. And so we have never even bothered to imagine what a model looks like. And many times, people from the old guard, which a lot of celebrity chefs do tend to fall into. Um, when I say old guard, you know, people who are well established, have lots of cookbooks, money, met multiple restaurants. Um, this is a system that despite the odds, because of their own privileges, whether that was being a white man, whether that's coming from a wealthier family, whatever, they were able to like climb to the top. And now instead of wanting to change, they want to just further the system. They essentially want to kick the can down the road until the system collapses. Well, now the system has collapsed because of COVID-19, and now everyone's scrambling to try and figure out what to do. And I think that fundamentally means we have to change the system on which the restaurant industry is built. Um, and I mean, that's a whole bigger conversation about capitalism, but should restaurants be oh, like 99% for profit? Personally, I don't think so. I think a lot of restaurants can operate in different ways, whether that's co-ops, nonprofits, worker-owned, like stakeholder, whatever. There's a lot of different models that we haven't even bothered to explore because we've been so stuck on looking at for-profit models. And with for-profit models, it's all about creating wealth and accumulating wealth for shareholders, owners, and so that they can hoard that wealth and not redistribute it to their workers. And so it creates this huge, you know, spectrum of how much, you know, in, like Iron Chef X is making versus their worker. So of course it's easy to not only verbally or perhaps like, you know, sexually assault them in their restaurant, but also take advantage of them. There's studies that show the workers that like receive or like are subject to the most um, wage problems, like wage theft are usually the ones that are making the least, which is like mind boggling, but it's because those people are easy to take advantage of. So if we're not putting in support systems and safety nets for them, then like we're not really doing a good job of uplifting the entire industry. And I think that's the hard thing when it comes to change is that it's easy to be a proponent for change that suits you and that suits the people that you like or the suits the people that you're familiar with, your friends, but are you making sure that change supports everyone? And that includes people you aren't familiar with, the dishwasher, the porter, or maybe people that you're not, you know, when you were talking about change in terms of all of America, like people with different gender identities than you, you know, or sexual orientations that maybe aren't in your inner circle of friends. Are you still advocating for them? Um, that's, that's like what we need to get to. And it, it is hard, but that's the work. 
<laughs> it's definitely hard, but you are definitely contributing to this conversation, Jenny. Thank you so much for your work. Um, we have one question via email. Uh, what are you doing, Jenny, to drive the world to greater food sustainability, better land management, reduced overfishing, reduced carbon footprint of the global food trade? I mean, do you know how much CO2 is created in capture, processing, and transport by New Yorkers eating prawns yeah. caught by in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a question that came from Michael via email. Yeah, I mean, that's a hard one because food sustainability is, it's a complicated, I mean, it's really, the problem is capitalism, right? There, are, unless it was cheaper, like we wouldn't be randomly just shipping our chickens whole to China, having them cut them up and then ship them back here. That is absurd. But somehow that is still less expensive than having a processing plant, you know, next door. Um, there's a lot of like slaughterhouses. If you look at there's an article from the New York Times that talks about how so many farmers had to just let their crops rot in the field or literally drain, like, you know, poured milk out because there wasn't proper distribution systems um, for small entities. And a lot of like restaurants or, you know, food service didn't need their ingredients because of COVID-19. So anyway, um, to answer your question specifically what we're doing about it, I guess we're not hosting any events. But I think in general, we're advocating that people are a little bit more conscious of what the restaurant models are. And we're working on putting together a coalition about business ethics. So industry leaders from different, yeah, different industries would come together and talk about what ethics means in their particular industry. Because sometimes, if, even if you look at like products, do some products even need to exist? Like, is it ethical to actually create a company to make swimwear made from recycled plastic containers. I'm not saying that it shouldn't exist, but like, let's just think about it. Um, that requires energy, human resources, time, labor to create more stuff, you know, that is using some of the stuff that we don't want anymore, but it creates more stuff. Um, so there's a lot of these kind of like seismic questions uh, that we hope that we can cultivate the right not on the right audience and the right people, but start putting together resources around kind of like what we did with our experimental salon model into our toolkit. Um, we'd like to do that around business ethics. And of course, food would be part of that conversation. Um, but for people who are interested in food sustainability, I recommend following um, Food Tank. They're a really great think tank that's been around for a long time. And they specifically talk about food agricultural systems. Wonderful. So we have a question from India. Jag asks via email, do you offer a plant-based experience and have you considered the ethics behind the industrialized meat industry and how can you combat it? Yeah, that's, a, that's definitely hard. Um, we don't always do, like I would say the, the most of the menus that I make have meat on them. I cook with meat. Um, I'm will eat vegetarian sometimes or vegan, but I do eat meat. Um, I don't have anything against uh, meat consumption if it's done in the right way. However, obviously we are not going about it the right way. So I think advocating for eating less meat, I have like talked about that on my Instagram or talked about it in interviews that I think we should all be eating less meat and just being a little bit more wary of where our meat is coming from. Um, I'm also not a big fan of like the fake meat that's been going on. Um, we can maybe that's a different conversation. I won't spiral into that. But I think in general, it's about how do we talk about food so that it's, it's not a commodity, I think is the bigger theme we're kind of getting at with both of these questions, is the reason that we are essentially driving our food industries into the ground is because we want to make a profit from them instead of recognizing that food shouldn't be a commodity. It's a, it's a public good. And so in order to make sure that public good is around for the next millennia, if we're there around that long, we have to ensure that we have multiple fail safes along the government, along society, along whatever different structures to um, not only keep food at a certain quality, but make sure it's accessible and make sure that it's a regenerative um, at every aspect of the cycle. And I think that's the, that, those are the conversations we are trying to promote in the food industry, but it, it's challenging when you operate in a capitalist society capitalistic society where if you ask a restaurant owner like maybe you do you want to buy a more ethically sourced product that's 3x the price 
they say no because they can't afford it. And that's not wrong either. Like we shouldn't be demonizing small business owners for making hard decisions, but how do we remove them from having to make that hard decision because those food, like the bad option shouldn't exist at all. Right, right. Another question via YouTube, Michael Strauss asked, do chefs have an ethical obligation to produce sustainable meals rather than seeking the most profitable paths? Um, I think that they should, but there's no, there's currently no ethical obligation besides, you know, your own ethics, but your own personal moral ethics, which I think is part of the problem because food is always treated as like, well, get it, like wherever gets the highest margin, go for it. Um, that's the best use of food. Um, whether that's, uh, like you can look at that on one end in agriculture, if you can get more money selling your corn as ethanol, then sell it as ethanol. That's what capitalism tells you to do, right? Um, um, if you look at restaurants and chefs, like if you can make more money selling this kind of cuisine to a certain group of people, then sell it to that group of people and don't worry about trying to nourish the community or don't worry about trying to uplift the community and don't worry about the sustainable consequences of it. Um, that is the incentivization structure that's in place. I don't think it's fair to say like chefs specifically need to sacrifice so that they're not, you know, so that they don't make any money in order to be more sustainably sustainable and be more, I guess, ethical than other people. Like how do we change the incentivization structure fundamentally so that chefs like automatically want to do this because there's always going to be some chefs who are ethically obligated or ethically inclined. And there's going to be many more that aren't. Um, and we can't just rely on like the goodwill of the people to drive that change. And we can't rely on like individual free choice and desire either. It has to be like a systemic and institutionalized change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, just give me one second. Uh, Chroma and Sapor ask, what are your thoughts on how food service would look outside the surplus production profit-based society? Um, I mean, what I would like to see is that there should be different types of food service and that the majority of food service would uh, be focused on how do we nourish the community in ways that are affordable and that like food is, that does not present obstacles to uh, furthering whatever you want for your life. So, you know, you can take that for example, meaning the food in schools should be healthy, should be nutritious, should be balanced, whatever. But you can also take that to mean like when um, like veterans come home, like they should be able to like be taught how to like handle cooking and like have ways to actually eat healthy. New moms should be able to stock their pantries in like the right ways, et cetera. Like I think it's, I think all of that sort of food service could look a lot different. Um, and that would be the bulk of food service, just like focus on making all of those people's lives better. And then I still think that there can be and should be a sliver of food service that is for profit, that is going to serve, you know, those that have the surpluses, so, so to speak, in economic terms, they can use those surpluses at those for-profit institutions. They can go to your michelin star restaurant, you can go to your fancy whatever, um, and it doesn't have any fancy, maybe just like an upscale restaurant, um, and they can spend their money there and get a special kind of service, food, whatever that they're craving. But the price of that would be like hopefully enough. So everyone in that chain of command is getting paid properly, and it only constitutes maybe like 10% of all food service, and the rest is about community building. Yeah, that would be terrific. So Jenny, another interesting question, and this is, um, this is something that I hope we could do together with Asia Society. Are you going to do an online cooking event so that we can have some of your uh, virtual food during the lockdown? Um, I've done a couple, a couple private ones <laughs> for companies, but yes, I'm happy to do it. You can always hire me to do a private <laughs> one. <laughs> um, and I am going to do one with uh, a, a clothing company I forgot um so like I've, I've yes if you follow me on Instagram you'll see some come up at some point um I also have done some with 
company called Kitchen Rodeo, and they're really great. So chefs donate their time to do cooking classes, and it raises funds for um, various charities. So I was part of one for Asians for Black Lives. Um, there was a lot of awesome like New York-based um, Asian chefs that were part of that. So definitely recommend checking them out, and you can pay and see my video too. That's terrific. Um, Jenny, one more question about um, the relationship between health, food, health, and people. So who, what is the impact of uh, food globalization on the change in diet and health of different ethnic groups? For example, um, you know, tomatoes being brought from Amer the Americas to Europe, uh, you know, sugar being brought from from caribbean to all over the world i mean uh, how has the imp how's that how has that impacted uh, global trends and obesity diabetes and other metabolic disorders yeah i mean there's a lot to unpack there um and i wouldn't say that you know the it's necessarily good or bad it's just that you have to look at the power structures that were in place of when those transfers happen. You see a lot of food, I mean, all food is fusion in a way, right? Um, you see a lot of food and cultures being translated and traveling along like the Silk Road, which you could say is like more of an organic thing. And then you see dairy being drop shipped into uh, Nigeria because of British rule, and that is colonialization, and that's a very different thing. And like, does that mean that both of those things have not spawned into some ugly and some positive things? No, but at the same time, when you look at, so for example, um, I wrote a piece about um, obeyasa, which is a, kind of like a, a tomato and then um, hab habanero or scotch bonnet based, uh, kind of like a stew um, that's from Nigeria. And one of the, like one of the uh, people I interviewed for the chef, she talks a lot about there's so much colonization in Nigeria and that's why um, there's these dairy products in their diet and like, you know, that it's become such a prevalent thing. Nobody really thinks about it anymore. But at the same time, that's not part of their ancestral diet. And she's been, you know, really wanting to dig more into that. And there was a comment being like, well, why are we talking about this? Because uh, they wouldn't have had tomatoes if it weren't for the new world. And so it's like, it's this untangling of like, we have to not, be so defensive when we even speak about it because at the end of the day there's just a lot of pros and cons um, that has happened through globalization of food um, not all of it has been good for sure but at the same time like how do we look at what is happening now if you look at Nigeria like right now Unilever owns like all of the CPGs that are being sold there how do we unravel that and how do we give equity back to the farmers that are there the people who want to eat differently like how do we change that now um, versus saying like you shouldn't use tomatoes like that's kind of like out of the question they're going to use tomatoes let them have the tomatoes but let's like let's remove what was the problematic parts of that which is they don't have choices in the healthier eating because it's being controlled by this giant company overseas um, so I guess to answer your question a lot of it comes down to food anthropology. People need to be better educated on where their food comes from and why, and what kind of power dynamics uh, resulted in that exchange. And if those power dynamics still exist within that country or that region today, and if so, are they damaging? If they're damaging, how do we reverse the damage? How do we mitigate future harm? Yeah. And, and, and the politics of food are so interesting also, Jenny. Um, how is food political? I mean, it shapes how we feed ourselves. You know, sometimes that's healthy, sometimes it's not. We have access to healthy people, uh, healthy food, but healthy food is expensive, right? Mm -hmm. So food is one way in which we reinforce privilege. Then how do you see this aspect of food? Yeah, I mean, the fact that healthy food or what is generally considered healthy food here in the U.S., is expensive is exactly that you know use of food to further perpetuate privilege and i talk about this in a post well <laughs> that's titled food is political but many times food is used as control because at the end of the day food is a necessity which is why it should be a public good and that's the whole uh, conversation about food service but because it's a necessity and people need it to survive it's also a, the ultimate means of control and whether that means you need to subordinate people so for example um when 
uh, all of our forefathers, um, our American forefathers came to America or came to specifically the United States and removed a lot of the Native Americans from their land. Like they literally moved them from one place to another place. And I never like understood the genocidal impact of that until I interviewed an indigenous chef and she was saying like that is genocide by food. These people, my ancestors didn't know how to hunt on this new land because they got moved from like North Dakota to like God knows where, you know? They didn't know how to harvest from that land. So then what happened is that they became dependent on the rations given to them from the colonizers. And those rations were very low, nutri low in nutritional quality um, and has led to huge spikes in like obesity and heart disease within indigenous communities. So again, that's like two prongs is that not only were they dependent on these rations, but now they're dependent on a, our broken healthcare system because the food access that they've uh, historically have what was bad and now their bodies like you know are not well accustomed to healthier foods like it's there's it's such a powerful way to essentially ensure that people fall in line with what you want them to do food is used as punishment in prisons which I also talked about um, there's a really good like NPR like four minute thing that you can listen to about this but it is a very powerful way to get people to to essentially listen um, it's also a, a way to segregate different types of people like I think all Asian Americans have that like lunchbox story of you know being called like oh gross or whatever that smells but that's how you other people because they eat differently than you their food smells differently than yours it looks different than yours um it becomes a powerful way of like in group and out group and once you're in an out group then you're not only are you not protected you're also subject and you're I guess uh, you're, you have like people, the other group has rationale to attack you and to hurt you. And many times, if you look at the kind of uh, dialogue that politicians will use when they talk about people that they don't like of the out group, it's usually in these like food analogies. So like, you know, they're rats or they're cockroaches. And that is all infestations of food. Um, so it's, it's just like all around us. Um, sometimes it just takes a little bit of being a little attuned to recognize that food is really kind of the basis of so much of not only our warfare, but also our community. Very well said, Jenny. What, what about children and, and how, how children are being segregated through their lunchboxes at school? Tell, tell us about this a little bit. Yeah, I think it's really important for um, children to recognize early on that what they eat is like it is part of their identity and therefore if it's not accepted you know then that means their identity isn't accepted so if their identity is accepted then that means like all food is american food that's i think the next stage beyond tokenization right is you don't need to tokenize asian americans because asian americans are americans like we're all americans this is american food this is why the international or the ethnic aisle shouldn't exist because like their curry is just, you know, curry paste. I guess there's, there's also feelings about curry. So maybe a bad example, but noodles are just as American as anything else as pasta. Like why isn't it in the same aisle? So I think if, if we're showing children early on that, you know, their food is disgusting or their food habits are gross because they eat with their hands or because they use chopsticks or because, you know, they like to like use the rice as a little ball and like pick it up that is so harmful and so toxic and it stays with people for the rest of their lives. I mean, it's trauma that like I still have to deal with. It's trauma that I've talked about repeatedly. And so it's definitely faded over time, but it's definitely still there. Right. Very true. Um, Tyler Brown likes to point out that um, sustainability advocates to put too, mu put too much onus on chefs who are not responsible for it. And that she wants to, to see, uh, she wants to point out how interesting the balance is right there. But, uh, you know, we're all responsible to keep our planet green and every, everybody's uh, little effort counts. Um, one more question here. Let me see. Let's talk about dessert. Um, one of your cocktails uh, is entitled Eggs and Bananas, and it's based on uh, a 
derogatory term used to call Asians who uh, are too white or too act, are, act too white or act too Asian or what, what, what is that? Please tell us all about that, Jenny. Sure, yeah. Um, Eggs and Bananas is one of the cocktails in Asian in America. It's um, yeah. my husband that um, is our, our mixologist and so he designs all our cocktails and he is a white American. Um, and so it's kind of a joke, but also a conversation starter. So an egg is someone who's yellow inside and white on the outside. So like an Asian that acts really white. And then a banana <laughs> um, is someone who's like white on the inside and uh, uh, yellow on the uh, outside. And so, you know, it's kind of a joke at like two of us because he's definitely been called um, like he's, you know, he's a banana uh, because yeah, um, is he a banana or is he an egg? No, he's an egg. <laughs> Sorry, I get so confused sometimes. Um, because he like basically has become Asian <laughs> ever since he started. Uh, he married me and like craves Asian food or really identifies with um, a lot of aspects of like Chinese culture. And then at the same time, I get called like whitewashed all the time. Like and like my hair is dyed, whatever. Like you know, we I've definitely heard the brunt of all the hate mail. Um, and so. On one hand, that's really harmful and it's really toxic. But then on the other hand, is like, what do you do with people who do identify naturally with out identities and cultures outside of their own? Um, is should we be calling them names? Probably not. But like, how do we have that conversation? Because there are plenty of white people, black people, Latinx people who probably speak uh, Chinese better than me, who have spent longer time in China, who feel a stronger sense of identity there. And like, they deserve to be seen and heard too. And so how do we even have that conversation? Because they don't look Asian, you know? Why, like, why is it that how you look specifically has to be how you identify? And this kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier, is like, how do people identify? And this is like, this is slippery slope because you don't want to get into like a Rachel Dolezal situation where she's white and she's like, I identify as black. Like, you don't want that. But then like, where's the in-between where it can still be respectful, but you can, you know, pay homage to something that you identify with that's not from your background. Um, it's just about having that conversation. And what's the recipe of that cocktail? Uh, it is um, flash aged, uh, French oak flash a Baijiu, um, which we really wanted to highlight Baijiu because it's the number one consumed liquor in the world. People don't know that, but it's there to find it outside of China. And it has like a very, it has a very specific smell. I personally don't love it too much, but it has kind of this gasoline-y smell, but it's not like moonshine. It's like much sweeter, kind of, it's just, it has, it's like its own thing, kind of like cilantro. You can't really describe cilantro in relation to other things. Um, it has Amaro Montenegro, oolong tea, um, and it also has something else that I feel like I'm forgetting. But on top of it, there is salted whipped cream. And so the inspiration behind this is there was like a cream cheese tea phase that was happening like everywhere. And you would see like the cream cheese teas. Um, it started mm -hmm. in China and came over to the States. And so uh, much like with cocktails, like because tea are, is sometimes bitter, they were adding, you know, this whipped cream cheese foam on top of it. Um, and that would give it nice mouth feel and it would be a little salty and a little sweet. So similarly with this um, beverage, it's, you know, it's, it's nicely bitter, alcoholic, and then there's like that salty, creamy, sweet from the cheese. And then the double entendre is that this is a uh, cup, uh, this is like a, a, uh, a trend that happened, originated out of Asia, and this is like a white person spin on it. <laughs> but the trend it. itself is kind of white to begin with, right? So it's, yeah. Uh, I, I just love your creativity, Jenny. It's wonderful. So, we have, we're coming to an end, but I wanted to throw this last question in. As you know, UNESCO has designated traditional French, Mexican, Japanese cuisines as cultural treasures. And I wanted to know if, if you have uh, introduced these cuisines in your menus and how, and how did you do each one of them? And I'm particularly interested because those three cultures are part of my own personal heritage. So I, I, I really want to know how you do this one. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that I cook 
either any of those <laughs> foods. I've definitely learned of all of those foods in culinary school. Um, but in Asian and America specifically, we do talk about French cuisine, usually in contrast to how it's um, shown relative to many Asian cuisines, especially Chinese food. And we talk about the relative like inherent value that people seem to derive from something being French versus something being Chinese. So the last dessert course is called Fancy Because It's French. And it's a, a, a moon cake. Um, it's made in a like a silicone mold, not a traditional wood press mold. Um, but it has all these flavors of a traditional moon cake. There's red bean, um, there's like sesame, there's like that's kind of like texture, I guess, taste from the wrapper. Um, there's an egg in the middle. Uh, however, it's all made through French techniques. And arguably French techniques are less complicated or maybe it's the same amount of complicated depending on how you look at it as um, how to make a moon cake. But when it's French, sometimes it commands a higher price point. So untangling what that means. Um, but I don't, when they incorporate tons of Japanese or Mexican like inspiration in my food. I definitely am inspired by it, but I wouldn't call anything that I do like authentically Japanese or Mexican, but I really love going and just like exploring in those places. Um, those like kind of my happy places to just go and eat. It's like a very, I think it's a very different approach to food culture. And it's nice to see that American food culture and the way we see it is not uh, universal. And just mm -hmm. getting out of the country, sometimes you need that to be reminded of. Yeah. Well, Jenny, you have no idea how much I enjoyed today. This is really, thank you so much for joining us. I, I actually can't wait to see the future of your uh, dinner series, The Glass Through the Skin, um, yeah. and more of your amazing philanthropic work uh, that you're, you're doing, I'm sure, and you will continue to do. So thank you, and thanks okay. our to our audience for joining us. And until next time, Jenny, thank you so much. Thank you.